and it goes a little something like this. As you all know, I love me some 90s. The colours, the collectibles, the graphics, the TV, the orange soda, the sesame's treat, the crushes, the numbskulls, and of course, the games. And today I'm going to jump into the deep end with the game series that without a doubt is more 90s than anything previously mentioned stuck together with Nickelodeon Gak. I am of course talking about Toe Jam and L. Oh, I timed this one right, haven't I? 28 years this series has been shoehorning Attitude and plenty of other 90s style fangs down our throats and although plenty of characters can be a tad annoying when they are injected up to the eyeballs with Tewed Serum, for some reason these two aliens from Funkatron seem to do it right. One of the most important games for Sega's best when going directly into competition with Nintendo's best. There really isn't anything like Toe Jam and L, and if you want to play it, then you'll have no choice but to bring the arcade experience home. Yeah, boy, go get yourself a pair of Aladdin ball bag trousers because for the next 20 minutes or so, you are very much welcome to join me as we take a look at the most 90s video game ever made. Toe Jam and L, where we'll be looking at the game's history, its development, its legacy, and of course, its games. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Ah, good old Toe Jam and L. If I'm going to be honest, it was the second game for me that first grabbed my attention back in the day, and it wasn't until emulation and eventually my own copy that showed me the true meaning behind this series. I mean, come on, what even is this game? Is it a platformer? Is it a dungeon crawler? A roguelike? Well, as you will soon find out, I am not the only person that got confused by this. But hold up, hold up, because Panic on Funkatron, yeah. I think we're in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves here, guys. So, let's go back to the beginning. And here we are in the late 70s, where a young Greg Johnson was very much into the obvious arcade games for the time, such as Space Invaders. But on top of the arcades, he also had an interest in computers too, as he attended a local community college where he took a Fortan programming course and ended up programming his first ever game where the PC would do plenty of involved calculations to replicate a sword fight with a single line of text output saying, you hit or you miss. In his own words, it was boring as hell, my first lesson in game design. A few years later, and Greg, who by the way had quite the fascination with aliens, decided to study biolinguistics at the University of California in San Diego in an attempt to hopefully one day learn how to speak with whales, gorillas, or dolphins. Hmm, sounds familiar, right? I was sure the dolphins and whales had an advanced underwater civilization, and I was going to be the bridge between our worlds. I also really wanted to be the one the Pentagon called in when the aliens landed, and they needed someone to figure out their language. <laughs> when I first heard this, I thought he was joking, but no, he brings this up in quite a few interviews. Lofty goals, I must say. But anyway, fair play. And it was whilst Greg was at the university in 1982 with his only real proper experience of gaming still being found in chewing gum covered BO filled dark and dingy arcade rooms when he finally did discover proper gaming at home and his mind was blown. Yes, it was the Atari 800 that impressed him the most, as well as another game known as Rogue for the Commodore 64, which we will discuss a little bit more later on. And night after night, Greg found himself playing these games until the early hours of the morning. Because of this, inspiration started to take over, and before you know it, he was looking to make another game, this time a proper game. His housemate was the one to um, blame, as he had just brought home the legendary console and he was actually working with a new, rather small company of about 20 people or so called Electronic Arts. And Greg saw this as his way in. 
The first game Greg and co worked on over the summer was one called Starflight, a very old school, obviously, space exploration game that if you're into this sort of thing was not only impressive for the time, but sold incredibly well and got high scores all round, including 1987's Adventure Game of the Year by Computer Gaming World. Although Greg often thought to himself that he would do this gaming lark for, you know, just one more year or so before going back to university, <laughs> this obviously never happened. And although Starflight was almost cancelled by EA several times, mostly due to the game being a whole year over target, it was such a success when it eventually did release that according to an interview with Greg, he was able to earn back quadruple his input. Not only keeping him in the gaming industry, but also keeping him with inside the walls of EA themselves. Before long, he managed to work his way into a sort of designing role, contributing graphics for such games as Adventure Construction Set and Sword of Twilight. I quite enjoyed making pretty pictures on the Amiga. It still amazes me that I got paid for doing art. After this, one of the more notable games from Greg's early days was the title Caveman Uglympics, back in 1988. This is essentially California games, wink wink nudge nudge, as it is simply just lots of fun mini game like sports games but set in a Jurassic timeline. It was really meant to be a party game, it was a blast with four people who wanted to get silly. Continuing on his awesome job at EA, Greg who was still a complete rogue fanatic, an alien fanatic and of course the designer of not only Starflight but in 1989, Starflight 2 when putting all of these game styles together. It's pretty obvious where the inspiration for Toe Jam and L came from. In fact, after such hardcore games as these, not only is the gameplay obvious, but you can also see why Greg wanted to take a bit of a break from the serious side of gaming and make something a little bit more fun and light-hearted, taking inspiration from what he had already done before. In fact, it was whilst Greg was on a beach in Hawaii, winding down from all of these gritty games, when he actually came up with the gameplay idea for Toe Jam and L. But the characters themselves, well, those came in a dream. He woke up in the middle of the night after dreaming of speaking to funky rap homeboy aliens, and he quickly wrote it down so he wouldn't forget it, and when he woke up the next day, he drew down the designs and voila, Toe Jam and L. It was in that same year that Greg was introduced to programmer Mark Vorzanger on a walk on Mount Tam in California, and the two hit it off very quickly. And when at the top of the mountain, the two started exchanging ideas for their dream game. We pretty much decided to work together on the spot. I'd already fought up Toe Jam and L and was telling Mark all about it on that first walk. He thought it sounded hecka fun, and that's part of what got us off the ground together. Whilst Greg was finishing off his work with Starflight 2, the duo formed Johnson Forzanger Productions and continued evolving the idea that was Flow Jam and Whirl. <laughs> yes, back when Greg was telling Mark the names of the character, Mark obviously misunderstood what was being said and accidentally named them Toe Jam and L. In fact, this somehow stayed in the game until the game was showed to Sega, but considering Sega liked the names so much, they just decided to keep them. But before we continue down the Toe Jam and L fact route, I suppose it's a good time to take a look at the game itself. Wake up! So what is Toe Jam and L? As discussed earlier, it's actually quite hard to pinpoint down, as there really isn't much else like it. But as stated before, so much inspiration came from that game, Rogue. Just like that game, you find yourself in a randomly created world, that is if you have the random mode selected, but unlike that game, you need to slowly wander around searching for pieces of your spaceship as you've crash landed here on Earth. <laughs> yes, this is Earth. However, as the game is completely random, there 
might not actually be a piece of the spaceship on the floor that you're on. Regardless if there is one or not, once you've found what you need to find, including power-ups found in presents, and oh by the way, presents could possibly contain items that hinder your progress, that's the gamble you take, you eventually take what you've collected and go to the next floor with your fingers crossed hoping that a ship piece will be found on that floor. And you continue this loop until it's game over or you find all the pieces of your spaceship. If I was going to explain this game to a new age audience, I would suggest gamers that enjoy stuff like Don't Starve and, well, I suppose Binding of Isaac. But for those that feel like these games are just not kid and play enough, then this game is definitely for you. Oh, and by the way, there is absolutely no way I can talk about this game without talking about the music. Seriously, it's some of the best on the Mega Drive. During its development, the two often found themselves listening to funk music and very early on decided that this was the route they wanted to go down for the game's soundtrack and style. It was actually John Baker, who was the game's composer, who took this idea, as well as the music from the incredible Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters group, when he put together the soundtrack making Toe Jam and L so incredibly unique. The game is just so bloody random, but besides its awesome gameplay, that's exactly what makes it so good. I mean, seriously, how the hell do you ever pitch this sort of idea? Well, as you'll soon see, even Sega themselves didn't really see the everlasting appeal that this game would bring even after it was released. Because when it was released, yes, the vast majority of reviews did seem to like it a lot, giving it 90% and up across the board. Nobody really knew how to promote it, and at first it was actually considered a flop as it didn't sell too well at all. However, unlike other games, this one has stood the test of time, and the whole time during the Mega Drive's lifespan, this particular title continued to sell from an average rate to a great rate as word spread about just how good this game actually is. But Sega was still not too sure, which is why even though the game was pitched easily at Sega from the beginning, back when Sega of America only had 20 members of staff on board, when the duo got to work on the sequel, which would have obviously been a more advanced version of what came before, including the chance to be able to enter buildings, Sega's marketing simply didn't get it and had no idea how to sell it. So sadly they threw all of their work away which they had done up to this point and turned this present collecting marathon into a side scrolling platformer present collecting marathon. Because well obviously this was the 90s wasn't it? The following contains subtitles for our non-funk speaking audience. Yo what up dog? I'm gonna drop some knowledge about my boy Toe Jam and who? Earl, the game is beat fresh, bam, all that boy. Yo, peep out my man DJ as he flex. And here go crunch nasty Earl checking out the house in the hood. In other words, I highly recommend it. Sega! Toe Jam and Earl panic on Funkatron game and Sega Genesis each sold separately. Okay, so this is probably the only part of the video that will split my audience right down the middle. If you like Toe Jam and L, you no doubt like the classic top-down roguelike games. I'm interested in seeing what you guys think about this one in the comments below, but for me, well, like I said, I had this one as a kid, or at least knew someone that had it and I borrowed it for way too long, and I actually quite like it. Is it better than the first? No, but it isn't a bad game. The idea this time is that you're back on planet Funkatron after returning from the first game. Annoyingly, you ended up bringing back loads of humans on your ship and now you need to bottle them all up and return them back home. You do this by searching all over the planet in bushes and trees, getting plenty of weird and wonderful power-ups along the way. And because of this, what you have is a game that actually is a lot more unique than you may think. Fans of the original were a little bit miffed, but reviews were still very solid, yet again getting pretty much 90% and up across the board. For me, I'm kinda glad that they mixed it up for a sequel, especially considering they continued the original formula in later versions of the game, but with all that said, it's most definitely not as good as the original game, and you know what? Sega knew it too. In an interview with Greg, he explains a time after the game's release when he went for a meal with Sega's VP of development, one Toyota Shinobu, and it reads, He admitted that it was probably a mistake on Sega's part to jump to a side-scroller. I told shinobu some that I guessed that this was the closest thing I'd ever get to an apology from Sega. He smiled, and I must say was very gracious about it. 
It was about this time that the JVP or Johnson Vorsanger Productions decided to change their name to ToeJam and L Productions. But before getting into the unappreciated third game, there are a couple of other instances of ToeJam and L worth mentioning. Firstly, Art Alive. Yep, just like Sonic, the funky alien Rude Boys cameoed in this. And remember the Menacer? Well, as part of the packing cartridge collection of games, you also had Ready Aim Tomatoes, where you apparently play as Toe Jam, although I never actually knew this as a kid. And yeah, you shoot tomatoes. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Should we move on to Toe Jam and L3? You see, there was a bit of a wait for the third game as the two ended up actually doing quite a few different non toe Jam and L-related projects whilst the world continued to build up the rumour mill that a third game was being made for the Mega CD and then the 32X and then the Saturn. But this simply wasn't true. By the time 1995 had rolled around, the duo actually managed to get the rights back for toe Jam and L from Sega and in a bizarre twist, actually struck a deal with GT Interactive in 1998 to bring toe Jam and L free to the Nintendo 64. Thankfully nothing really got made here besides a little bit of market research which showed that fans of the series wanted a game like the original rather than the sequel and as the N64 was on its way out GT Interactive dropped the game leaving the two scurrying around to find a new home which they kind of did with the PlayStation 2 before quickly flip flopping again very quickly to the Dreamcast. Let's do it. Two Jam and Earl have come to Earth on a mission to keep folk alive. How you doing? Check out my third leg. Oh, come in, let me play with them pom pom. We're not your typical aliens. Two Jam and Earl. For funked out alien adventure, there's no power greater than X. Originally known as ToeJam, L, and Letitia to showcase that third rapper alien, work went ahead bringing the iconic franchise back home to Sega's final console. Sadly, ToeJam and L Productions found the workload of the third game a lot harder than expected, and therefore, visual concepts were hired to help finish the game. In 2001 at E3, a playable demo was shown off on the Dreamcast, but, well, you all know what happened next. Sega was on its way out, leaving an almost finished game, now known as ToeJam and L all funked up for the third time, needing to find a new home. It was tough when we needed to switch over from the Dreamcast to the Xbox. It was a big decision. I wanted to go to PlayStation 2 or GameCube first, but there were lots of technical reasons to do Xbox first. It was much easier platform to develop for and always easier to go down than up when porting. Also, Microsoft wanted to expand their demographics, so they offered Sega Marketing lots of free TV advertising. Tough to pass up. But pass up he perhaps should have. You see, visual concepts, as good as a company as they were, were not 100% on board with creating what was essentially a 3D remake of the original. This was the early noughties after all, and what did the early noughties want more than 90s wanted 2D platformers? My 3D platformers, of course. Which is why, after no doubt many a heated discussion, the game ended up becoming a little bit of a mixed bag between those two ideas. Honestly, I actually really liked ToeJam and L3. I was a fan of both genres by this point and I think the game worked out a pretty good in between. And if you want to talk about style, my god, this game has it in spades. Just look at this title selection screen. Give it up, give it up, give it up for Master T. Say ho for the greatest rapper around the DJ TJ. I jam your rap, your head is spinning like a bee ball. Can't stop it, can't even slow it down, y'all. You know you got no choice, you gotta dance when I get going. Move to the rhythm of the funk when I get flowing. Gotta give it up, toe jam in the hood. <laughs> Damn, I'm good. You know they call me Earl and I don't say that much, so I'm just cruising in the funky flow, you know Everybody round, know they moving at high speed I'm chilling it down, you know, moving at my speed Everybody tripping, getting up in your face Gotta stay cool, gotta take it at your own pace The name's Leticia and I'm in the house now Breaking it down, the best I know how You know I'm new, but I know this much Yo, something was missing here, the female touch Gotta get 
busy, gotta do it good. Y'all step back, cause the teacher is in the hood. Oh, and by the way, this is Letitia, a pretty good third character if you ask me, and although she was eventually voiced by Sherry Jackson, who also voiced Quinton Hedgemouth in Psychonauts, there was a time when she was actually going to be voiced by Lisa Left Eye Lopez of TLC, but due to apparent costing issues, this sadly never happened. <laughs> Which sucks. It's not for everyone as the reviews most definitely reflected, but for fans of this series, I think you could do a lot worse than ToeJam & L3 Mission to Earth. Oh yeah, the name got changed again, for obvious reasons. I'd always feel like ToeJam & L3 didn't really get a fair shake. If I could do things differently, I would stick to my guns and refuse to budge, but in the moment, that can sure make you look like a stubborn prima donna to everybody else. Visual concepts did what they thought was right, and I'll never know if it would have sold better if we had done things my way. When you're a developer, you can't always do what you want. Best not to live with regret though, eh? 16 years later. I wanna take my phone for a ride. Oh yes, ToeJam and L made their way onto Kickstarter. <laughs> well, eventually, because there was actually another ToeJam and L game idea for the Nintendo DS under the working title ToeJam and L4, and there really isn't much here besides a few pictures and. Well, that's it. Publishers didn't show much of any interest and therefore the game didn't really go anywhere. So yeah, anyway, back to the video. Yes, they found their way onto Kickstarter and thankfully it's never gonna be showing up on a Kickscammer episode because my God, fans of the original, the very original will indeed be happy with what is on offer here. <laughs> Wait, was Greg right all along? Well, early review scores seem to think so, so with nothing but almost solid 90s and above, yet again in one of the best co-op experiences in recent times, this is ToeJam and L back in the groove. It was Greg Johnson's company Human Nature Studios that developed the game, and it was started shortly after Doki Doki Universe. Even though the campaign hit its goal rather nicely, although due to no major stretch goals being met, the game would literally just have to be bare bones, work got underway with ToeJam & L back in the groove. That was until Adult Swim Games came along and gave the game that much needed extra funds which although did delay it, helped get the game onto plenty of other platforms including the incredible Nintendo Switch, which is the system I was lucky enough to secure a physical ridiculously unnecessary collector set from Limited Run Games. And yes, it even includes the tape soundtrack. <laughs> For me, and I know I haven't really played it that much, but it does seem to nail the formula so well that it makes the original a little bit pointless, as it does it just so much better. But with all that said, besides the game's incredible game's play style and yet again killer soundtrack, this game feels like a mid-90s Nickelodeon cartoon come to life, and that's exactly what I didn't know I wanted. ToeJam & L back in the groove just seems to get it right. It nails it. And yes, sure, I obviously can't not mention its rather lengthy delays, but hey, at least they did eventually do it, and more importantly, they did it right. Which, let's be honest, is exactly what we wanted. So, there you have it guys, ToeJam & L, the complete history, and a seriously impressive history too. A series that surprisingly had plans for almost everything going, but thankfully always seemed to feel at home on the system that was without a shadow of a doubt the most tubular and radical of the bunch. And although looking back it may seem like the series really did struggle to find its footing after and heck even during the original game's release, only really gaining it back with the new crowdfunded game, hopefully this video has shown showcased exactly why the name ToeJam and L is just so massively important to balding middle-aged grey men around the world who still reckon they can do the b-boy stance when in actual fact all they're just doing is dad dancing. <laughs> oh, look at him go, go on my son. Now if you excuse me, my cap and jeans aren't facing backwards for nothing, my Stetsasonic LP finished ages ago, and my feet are sweaty from all the fish flopping in these high tops. So, I'm going to ask politely that you get the hell out of here whilst I sip on some gin and juice and play the most 90s game ever created, released in 2019. My name is ToeJam, and I'm Big Earl, mm -hmm. we come from outer space. Whoa, oh, 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 we crashed down on this planet, it was an accident, this is a crazy place, let me talk to you.
to him. Tell him. Look, T O to the E, jamming on the beat. And now a big Earl, make him stand to their feet. Uh, uh, crash landed on a strange planet. Trying to find a piece, but this place is gigantic. Running from the bees and dodging all the money. Hey there, guys. Thanks for checking out the most 90s video I ever made. I held this one off for the longest time, and I'm so glad I can finally release it. So, yes, somebody, I want to give a big shout out to all the patrons. But first, a big shout out goes to this video sponsor, player1clothing.com. There will be a link below. And if if you also want to check out the game that's playing on the screen, there'll be an affiliate link below for that too. But anyway, back to those patrons of a big extra, big extra, big shout out going to that retro video gamer, Gary Pinkett, Mantis, Ryan Burford, Andrew Dalton, Jonathan Hayward, Tomek Grabowski, Christopher Turnbull, Brent Craft, Ben Jackson, Phil Lowlands, Mr. Vestek, Dina, Robertson Dunn, Lefty Intrigued Gaming, Abby Morris, Tim Labonte, Sobi Quang DX, Tim Lund, Genovi, Hernanaz, Pixels Limited, aka Samuel Victor, Red the Beard, Conrad Constantine, Pretendo 64, Creamy Elephant, James Loveridge, Casey Garner, Blitz Hedgy, King Link, Reviews, Retro Gaming Castle, Savage and Mr. Drew, Gemma Mr. T-Shirts, Monster Finger Games, Creators of Alien Scumbag, Mike H. Fell, Lucer Softel, Ye Old Hamburglar, Gregory Arden, Bewrights, Ronnie Method, SSWB, Solix Captor, Jeremy Rodriguez, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Marcus King Emo Cut, Tyndall, June the Geeky Dad, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Todd Paul Float G, and Petty Mew. If you want to get your name shouted out, get your name shown, come see what I'm working on and all of the other usual stuff that these patrons get on a very regular basis then please click the link that you see on the screen don't forget to subscribe give the video a thumbs up or a thumbs down whatever you prefer but for now this is dj slope signing out and hopefully i'll see you all next time